Hi everyone, good morning and welcome to House, welcome to Online Church and um, we're so happy to have you with us on this beautiful sunny day, hopefully it's sunny where you are as well this morning and um, we're about to go into a time of worship so I'm just going to pray for us. We'd encourage you to get into a posture of worship, um, to stand up off your sofa, um, to sit down to kneel, anything that yeah gets you into God's presence and ready to receive. So I'm just going to pray for us as we go into worship. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much that even in a time of being scattered in some ways as a church, that you unite us, um, that you dwell amongst us. So Holy Spirit, I pray that for anyone watching right now, you would flood their living room, their kitchen, their bedroom, their homes, Father. You'd be with them and their families and whoever else is watching with them this morning, God. I pray that they would encounter you in a new and powerful way this morning, Father. So we say, come Holy Spirit and have your way. Um, come and move amongst us this morning. We're open to you and we're ready to receive from you. And we love you, Jesus. In your precious name. Amen. Oh, how patiently you love me. You're not 
promises are yes and amen. All your promises, all your promises are yes and amen. Faithful you are, faithful forever you will be, faithful you are. Hello, I'm Norma. I moved to Norwich with my family in 1979, living close to and worshipping in St Thomas's, with occasional forays over to St Albans long before it became involved in the Mitre Benefice, and ongoing from December 1979, becoming involved with many and various activities within St Barnabas Church. More recently, I have felt guided to help within the community of St Barnabas, then discovering that their PCC urgently needed more members. Being on more than one PCC at any one time is not allowed, so I resigned from the PCC at St Thomas and joined the PCC at St Barnabas Church, which is a hidden, often forgotten gem in the heart of a needy estate. Welcome to the Memorial Garden at St Barnabas Church. I am well aware that I can talk too much, but today I'm on a very tight time schedule. I am very happy to be part of the community at St Barnabas, helping to revitalise the parish, which now welcomes many young families living in the new development adjacent to the church. As lockdown eases, I hope to be part of a team raising the profile of the church and its very welcoming St Barnabas family, helping to grow the faith across the area and beyond, bouncy castles in the church and all. Whatever it takes, come and see us. Here are this week's notices. So we have a free employability course called Rework starting up on the 7th of June. The course will span over three weeks and it's just a great opportunity for those who might be feeling a bit apprehensive about re-entering the workplace or going to interviews and getting a job again. And um, please contact the email address below if you're interested in signing up and joining in. We have another one of our student worship nights coming up on Wednesday the 9th of June. We're really excited to gather together again as a student family, particularly before lots of you are heading back um, for your summer break. We had such an awesome time gathering together last week. So if you're interested, if you're a student and you want to come along and have some community worship, hear a word and just have some time to yeah, be in God's presence, then you can sign up and book your ticket at this address here. If you're watching this on a Sunday, we have the first of our Kingdom Come evening services happening tonight. Um, it starts at 6 p.m. and this will just be an hour long service um, with a long period of worship and time for ministry. We just wanna create a space for people to come and encounter God and just rest in his presence. So we're really excited to be gathering in this way at an evening service again. Um, yeah, if you're watching on Sunday and you're free this evening and wanna come along, you can book via this address. Last week I was sorting out some bookshelves and that meant moving some old photo albums. And I found myself opening up a few of them. And it was lovely looking back at the fun times we had with our children when they were really young. It's a bit like what we're doing in this sermon series in the book of Acts. This is our story, this is us. The story of our family as followers of Jesus and we're looking back at some of the early photos and remembering our beginnings so we can learn from them. One of the things I wanted to do was to put the albums in order. So I could easily find the photos of Sarah when she was born, when she was two, when she started school, when her brothers were born and so on. 
So if we think about the albums immediately before Acts, they show the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. But the story of Jesus didn't stop with Jesus. He was still with his followers by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts, what we see are the disciples, they're our forefathers, speaking with the authority of Jesus and doing the miracles of Jesus all over again. So if we flick through the pages of our family album, last week Joanna introduced us to Peter and John going into the temple. And on the way, they reach out to a lame man lying on a stretcher. And in the name of Jesus, they command him to walk. Wow, our first big family miracle. Crowds gather, and as Peter tells them more about Jesus, thousands more believe. Things are going from strength to strength. And you'd think the church would be flying from then on. But then, as we come to today's chapter, Acts 4, this is when it turns nasty. The authorities don't like it. They don't like the message that Jesus rose from the dead. They don't like the message spreading and thousands joining this new following and they want to stop it. So they clamp Peter and John in prison like common criminals and then they gather all the powerful people of the day to put the pressure on. Rulers, elders, teachers of the law, the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas, they were the ones who condemned Jesus to death. And they demand to know who gives Peter and John authority to heal this man. What will the believers do under pressure? What will we do under pressure? At this point, I'd like you to imagine a double spread in our album. First, on the left, we've got a picture of John hauled up before the court, and I've labelled that speaking of Jesus. Then, on the right, we've got Peter and John going back to the other believers, and I'll call that praying for power. Speaking of Jesus, praying for power. The two pictures belong together, both in the early church, and we need both here at St. Thomas too. So first, speaking of Jesus. Now, if you've got a Bible in front of you, then I'll highlight the key verses. And we're beginning to read from verse eight. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Did you notice the boldness with which Peter speaks? He doesn't sound remotely intimidated. Where does this come from? Peter is filled with the Spirit and then he speaks. The word filled here is not the same as the adjective full. Peter was already full of the Spirit. That had happened in chapter 2 at Pentecost. But the Spirit filled him afresh in this moment to give him the words he needed under pressure. While Jesus had been with his disciples, Jesus had predicted this would happen, that his followers would be brought before rulers on account of his name, but they were not to worry what to say. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to contradict. And this is exactly what Peter experiences. By the Holy Spirit, Jesus gives Peter words 
and wisdom and the authorities are dumbfounded. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who'd been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. Our forefathers were unschooled, ordinary men. They'd not been trained in the scriptures like the Jewish teachers. They were ordinary, like you and me. And most of us haven't got theology degrees. But what stood out was they had been with Jesus. They'd spent three years living with him, learning from Jesus, and were now speaking like Jesus, quoting the scriptures and applying it to the present situation. So what does that mean for us? Well, first it's reassuring, because when our faith is under any kind of pressure, maybe pressure from outside, maybe pressure from within, we are in good company. Jesus had pressure, his early followers had pressure, it's part of the deal. And we may often feel ordinary and inadequate, but that doesn't limit us. That's an opportunity to depend more on God and ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. So we too are given words and wisdom. Every day I ask God to fill me again, fill me with the Spirit of Jesus. It's not enough that he filled me 40 years ago or even that he filled me yesterday. Fill me today, dear Lord, because I'm going to need your power and your wisdom for every situation, every pressure that I am facing today. For Peter and John, the pressure doesn't go away. The authorities threaten them. They order them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Does this intimidate them? Will they now stop speaking of Jesus? Peter says this, As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Peter and John had been eyewitnesses of Jesus. Of Jesus alive, of Jesus dead, and of Jesus alive again. And they couldn't stop, they didn't intend to stop speaking of Jesus. And that's our story too. Each one of us who believes in Jesus has a story to tell of the impact Jesus has had on our lives. In a sense, that's all God asks of us, to speak about what we have seen and heard. That's what witnesses do. Has God answered any of your prayers? You've got a story to tell. Have you experienced a sense of peace, even in the midst of this awful pandemic? That's evidence Jesus is alive, because he promised in me you may have peace, though in the world you'll have trouble. So when the church hits pressure, they keep speaking of Jesus. And they do something else, really important as well. They pray for power. If you've read through the book of Acts, up to this point, you'll have seen it mentioned time and time again that our early family prayed together. Now we get to see how they prayed. When Peter and John are released, they head straight back to their own people and they pour out the details of what's happened to them. And what's the response? Do they complain? Do they wonder why God has allowed this to happen? No, they come together and they pray together. Follow it if you want, we're in Acts 4 and now verse 24. 
When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Does this sound like your prayers or mine or ours as a church? I've got a feeling if I had emerged from such intense pressure, I would have prayed something like, Lord, save us. Stop these authorities threatening us and protect us from even more threats. But that's not our family model. The first two thirds of the prayer focus entirely on God. Look how they address him, sovereign Lord. The Greek word is despotes. It means all powerful ruler. In other words, they acknowledge they're speaking to the God who holds absolute power. Next, they focus on what God has done. You made the heavens, the earth, the sea and everything in them. In other words, they get perspective. This sovereign Lord who made everything must then have made themselves and their enemies. That's how big God is. Then they remind God of how he'd foretold what would happen to Jesus in the words of Psalm 2, written some hundreds of years previously. Sure enough, the Jewish king and the Roman ruler had banded together to plot the death of Jesus, God's anointed one. But they were not the ones in control. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand would happen. In other words, nothing took God by surprise. Not what happened to Jesus, nor the threats that are happening to them. These disciples take the scriptures as their guide and their guide to make sense of what's going on rather than just the evidence of their own eyes. So they pray, they focus on God, they fuel their faith, and then they bring the situation to God. Now, Lord, consider their threats. In other words, you sort those out, God. They're your problem. And finally, we come to their ask. Enable your servants to speak out your word with great boldness. And then back it up with signs and wonders in Jesus' name. It's a bold prayer. It's boldness they ask for, and it's boldness they are given. As it says in verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I'd love us to pray bolder prayers and see them answered. I'd love us to pray more often together because it's often when we pray together, we are reminded of Bible verses which give insight into what is happening 
or the Holy Spirit gives words and pictures which show us how to pray and what God wants to do. That's my experience at our church prayer gathering every Tuesday at 8 in the morning online. We'd love more of you to join us and pray together. Check out the website. Speaking of Jesus, praying for power, they go together. Maybe if God's people hadn't prayed, the threats would have had the last word and fear would have set in. But our family did pray. And then refilled with the Holy Spirit, they continued to speak of Jesus and to perform signs and wonders in Jesus' name. John Wesley wrote, prayer is where the action is. And so God, as we prepare to enter a new chapter at St. Thomas Norwich, starting a new album, stir us to pray together, to seek your will together, and then do the works you have prepared for us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's episode of House. It's been awesome to have you gather with us online and virtually. Um, yeah, we hope you have an amazing week and we'll see you back here at the same time next week. See you later.